So, Yulia, I very much look forward to your presentation. The Thank floor you. is yours. <laughs> Thank you for the very um, nice introduction. Um, so first of all, um, you can find my slides online if you want to follow along. I'm also going to drop the um, link once again in the chat later. Um, I would like to thank the um, organizers for inviting me. To be honest, I feel like a bit of an imposter um, relative to the other excellent keynote speakers um, you invited. Um, but at the same time, I really enjoy talking about causal inference. So um, I'm not going to complain about that. And um, there's one particular reason why I like talking about causal inference. And that is um, when I heard about these issues the first time, I was like, no, why didn't anybody tell me about this earlier? Now things make so much more sense. And so I hope I will be able to share some of that feeling with you today and maybe clarify some things. So if your training um, looked anything like mine, first of all, you will have learned that correlation does not imply causation. And then you will have learned all sorts of statistical uh, models. Maybe you've also learned how to deal with missing data. Maybe you learned some lists of threats to validity, in particular if you're a psychologist. And then you might have learned some domain-specific practices. So for example, I looked at self-other agreement of personality. So how does how you describe relate to how others describe you? And there were all sorts of like, oh, you need to center the variables this way or that way because there's like normative confounding and so on. It was just like a lot of stuff I learned um, over the course of my work. And in the end, things got a bit messy um, in my head because you end up with like a massive toolbox. And in that toolbox, there are some things that are like very sophisticated and specialized tools. And they actually work quite well, are just not easy, that easy to employ. And I think a lot of things that you heard um, in this workshop already fit into that thing. So all these complex longitudinal models. But then you might have also learned a few things where like, I'm not sure whether this is actually the right tool for the job. It kind of looks like it, people are using it, but it also seems like it's, it's not going to really answer your research question. And then in the end, there's also a few things I learned where I definitely feel like, like what, the, what the hell is this? Um, just like this um, lipstick robot by Simone Gears, where it's like, why does this even exist in the first place? It doesn't make much sense to me. And so um, what I'm trying to um, tell you today is that um, there is like a bit of an alternative that makes everything fit together um, more neatly. And um, I believe that this one thing that is like missing to make it all come together is um, causal inference. And now I hope you're going to say, what? Well, of course you're going to tell me it's all about causal inference because you're a causal inference person. So you're in the business of trying to sell causal inference as an approach. Um, but as Manuel already said, so I'm, I'm not a methods person, I'm a personality psychologist. And then I just randomly took a workshop about causal inference um, by a sociologist, Felix Elbert. And I was like, wow, this is like super important, has a lot of implications for my own work, but also for other things happening in, in psychology. So I'm, I'm by no means like causal inference industry sure. I really just feel like it's the one thing that was missing in my work and that really helped me get any further. But to really drive home that I'm not just like a shill, um, I want to um, show you a bit that there's other people who are also arriving at the point that causal inference is really like the one thing and um, that has been missing in many parts of sciences. So for example, there is uh, Miguel Hanan, an epidemiologist, and from which I actually stole the title of his talk. So here is a paper called Less Casual Causal Inference. And he quite forcefully argues that health research really needs to be more explicit about causal inference. So they got that norm, oh no, no correlation does not imply causation. And if you didn't do a randomized control trial, you're not allowed to use certain words. But of course, still everybody is kind of trying to do causal inference. They just don't use that language. And so they end up with worse inferences. From a um, completely different field, um, there is Paulino Munt, who is a business economist, and um, for example, he talks about um, causal, uh, he talks about mach machine learning in the industry. And as you might know, this is now um, a big deal. Everybody is hiring people to do data science and machine learning, and he forcefully argues that it can really only work for decision making if it's complemented by smart uh, smart causal models. And so if anybody here is thinking about moving in the industry or something, I really recommend um, you check out that working paper because they actually interview data scientists working in the, in the industry about the tasks they are doing from day to day, um, the inference challenges um, they have to tackle. And you will also see that all of them say that like kind of causal inference has a huge potential. It's going to become a big issue in the industry probably soon. And then yet a completely different field, um, we got Richard McElruth, who is the director of the MPI for evolutionary anthropology here in Leipzig. And um, so he has a very popular textbook on Bayesian statistics that is called Statistical Rethinking. And so if you look into the first edition of the book, there is very little on causal inference in there, 
But then sometime, I think like four or five years ago, he really got into the topic. And now the second edition of his Bayesian stats textbook is like mostly about causal inference because he arrived at the point that actually it doesn't make really sense to talk about statistics without talking about causal inference as well. And so he also has talks where he argues that description also needs causal inference and so on. Um, and lastly, um, one statistician who really drives home this point is um, Sander Greenland. So um, he argues essentially that all of statistical science actually requires causal models. Because if you think about it, um, a lot of things start from the notion that you have like a random sample drawn from a population. And that is already a causal assumption because you have an assumption about the data generating mechanism. So it's not like these people were selected on the outcome, but no, they were randomly drawn independently of the outcome. And um, as we will later see, that is a causal assumption going in there. So long story short, there is an emerging consensus, I think across fields that um, causal inference has been neglected in many parts of the sciences. And there is much to be won by actually being more explicit about causal inference. Um, but I'm here to show and not to tell you that causal inference is great. So um, I want to give you like a very brief introduction of directed acyclic graphs. That is one possible framework to talk about causal inference. It's not the, the only one that exists, but I assume a lot of people here have a background in structural equation modeling. And if you're coming from that direction, directed acyclic graphs are very intuitive. And uh, after that brief introduction, I will try to convince you that if you learn more about causal inference, um, you get a lot of bang for the buck. So I will talk about inference issues that aren't directly related to causality, at least normally, um, in particular missing data and then generalizability across populations. And one thing we quickly need uh, to get out of the way is that there's um, essentially two different causal inference issues. So on the one hand, there's identification. And then on the other hand, there is the issue of um, estimation. And you can think about it this way. Identification is like in an ideal world, you had infinite data and given your assumptions, would you be able to estimate the causal effect of interest from the data you got at hand? And the estimation issue is then actually working in the real world. You don't have infinite data. You actually need to estimate the effect with the data you got at hand plus your assumptions. And um, I'm really going to focus on the identification um, side of things. Um, I think the other talks were more related to the estimation side of things. And I believe that most of us receive more training um, when it comes to estimation than when it comes to actual causal identification. And so um, the tool I'm going to present to you are directed acyclic graph. And let's assume we start with some simple research question. For example, we are interested in the effect of edu educational attainment on income. And of course, it would need to be more specific. So for example, holding a college degree versus not holding a college degree on your income at a certain age, maybe at age 50. And um, so we start with this and let's encode our additional assumptions. So for example, we might assume that childhood intelligence influences both our edu educational attainment and income causally. And um, in a deck, these arrows just imply any sort of causal effect. So there's a difference here to regular structural equation models that we do not talk about linear relationships or anything. It just means that at least for one person in the population, there is an effect of childhood intelligence on educational um, attainment. The functional form doesn't matter. So um, we can add more um, nodes, for example, in the model. For example, we do know, of course, that um, there is some stability in intelligence. So childhood intelligence will affect adult intelligence. But we also actually know from um, rather clever studies that educational attainment does have a causal effect on intelligence. So I think there's like estimates that you get like a few points of IQ per year of education. And of course, um, the adult intelligence will also have an effect on income. So um, this is like a simple variable constellation we can draw. And then we might add like just some random unobserved variables, for example. Um, it seems quite plausible that there might be something that affects both your income and your intelligence in adulthood. And we just add that as a mystery cause called U here. And so um, directed acyclic graphs are called directed because all the arrows are directed. They are pointing into one direction. And of course, you already see that we cheated a bit here because we added that mystery U and in a structural equation framework, you would probably just point it as a little double-headed arrow. We are not allowed to draw double-headed arrows in the DAX in the strict sense, but we can still represent unobserved joint causes with this little trick of adding a variable that we don't label 
Um, directed acyclic graphs are called acyclic because there are no cycles. So you can't travel along the variables and come out at the point where you started. And so, of course, in particular in psychology, we often believe that there are these feedback loops where a variable affects another one, which in turn affects the other variable again. And again, there's a little trick, and we already applied that actually, because we did say intelligence affects education and education affects intelligence, but we, we encoded it by like kind of um, get putting time in there. And so we have neutral causation, but there are no cycles because we have different time points. And so um, this is the basic way how you work with that. You start by drawing out your assumptions. And then you need to make one huge step to which we will come back later. And that is you have to assume that this is a causal deck. And a causal deck is one that um, alongside the variables of focal interest includes all common causes of these variables. And that is a strong assumption. We'll come back to these strong assumptions later. And um, maybe one, one nice thing to notice here, I mean, it's essentially the same as in structural equation modeling. So the hypotheses are not really in the errors. The, the hypotheses are in the absence of errors. So um, that tells you that a variable is not supposed to have a causal effect on another one, except for the paths included in the DAG. So um, the, the canonical way to work with this is applying the backdoor criterion. And that is a means to figure out which variables you should control for or adjust for if you want to recover the effect of interest. And um, the very nice thing is how you do that in DAG is like highly algorithmical. And that is you start by just spelling out all ways that you can travel from your independent variable of interest, education attainment, to your outcome of interest, income. And so um, you can travel both um, along the arrows or against them. And then you can just really trace out all the paths you can go and write them down. And so these are essentially all the ways through which these two variables could be collected. And then the next step, you need to figure out what to do with these different paths between the variables. And to do that, you can break them down into three fundamental structures. And um, I think at least two of them will be familiar to all of you. So first of all, there can be chains. So X has a causal effect on M, which has a causal effect on Y. And such a chain transmits a causal association. And if you condition on the variable in the middle, on the mediator, that blocks the transmission. So you remove that causal association in your data. And um, that is what many people know as mediation. Then um, the other fairly familiar structure is the so-called fork. So you've got a confounder in the middle and that transmits an association between two variables. And um, of course, as, as most of us know, this is like confounding. This is a non-causal association that is being transmitted here. And again, conditioning on the variable in the middle on the confounder blocks transmission. And then the third structure, which is um, probably the most interesting one or the least uh, well-known one is the so-called inverted fork where two variables jointly affect a third one. And so what's special about this inverted fork is, first of all, it does not transmit any association. Just because two factors affect one variable does not mean that they will be correlated in any manner. But the moment you condition on Z, for example, by controlling for this variable or by stratifying your sample on Z, you will actually all open the transmission of a non-causal association. In other words, this is a scenario in which third variable control introduces spurious associations. And that's the reason why you can't just throw everything into your model. And um, the bias that is induced by conditioning on a collider is also known as collider bias. And because this is not quite as intuitive um, as the other things, um, I got the, um, yet another example. And that is um, the effects of conscientiousness and intelligence on college attendance. And so um, it's quite easy to imagine, and there's actually an observation in real data, that if you have like a college sample, there is a bit of a negative correlation between intelligence and conscientiousness. But what is actually happening here is that, of course, to get into college, you're already selected on a number of variables. So for example, um, if you're very hardworking, it becomes more likely that you get into college. But if you're also really smart, you have better chances to get into college. And if you actually look at the whole population, including people that do not attend college, the association might as well be um, negative and might be zero. So what's actually happening is that the negative um, correlation only exists if you condition on college. And um, if you want, like another way to think about this is you can get into college um, by being really smart, but not as hardworking, or you can get into college by, be, by being really hardworking, but not quite as smart. And then of course, if you're both smart and hardworking, you will definitely get into college, 
Um, but there's only very few people who have this combination, assuming that the variables are uncorrelated. And so you get the spurious association because you're only looking at selected parts of the population. So going back to our initial example, we now have all these paths and we need to figure out what they transmit and how to take care of them. And so um, the, the obvious ones are paths that transmit non-causal associations that need to be blocked. And that is the one that was really obvious from which we started, that is childhood intelligence is confounding the association of interest. And then we actually got a second one that is confounding that is mediated via adult intelligence. And we need to block these somehow, for example, by um, conditioning on childhood intelligence. And the second one might also be blocked by conditioning on adult intelligence. But then there's also paths that to causal associations and it, that should not be blocked. And in particular, this is the path that is mediated via adult intelligence. That is part of the genuine causal effect of education attainment. So we do not want to control for it. And so that already tells us, okay, above we said we could control for adult intelligence. Here we see we can no longer do that. And then um, there are actually more complex paths that involve adult intelligence, where adult intelligence is actually a collider. So what we see here is that these paths do not transmit any association because there's a collider blocking them. But if we conditioned on adult intelligence, we would open them up. So yet another reason to not control for adult intelligence in this setting. And so um, if you combine all this together, assuming that this is the correct causal structure, the um, answer is actually very easy. And that is control for childhood intelligence is both sufficient and necessary to identify the cause and effect of interest. That is all assuming that this is the correct structure. structure. So what do we do in the next step? We have to condition on childhood intelligence. And these are all the different ways you've probably learned for how to condition on variables. So that might be simple stratification. This might be subgroup analysis. This may be regression adjustment, um, but also weighting and matching approaches that all try to achieve the same aim at this point. And um, I think one important point is that if your causal identification strategy was wrong, no amount of fancy estimation can rescue you. So for example, in psychology, propensity score matching got like really fancy at some point, but so it has some certain features that make it um, useful for some cases, but if a co-founder is omitted, propensity score matching won't really save you. And then of course, if your causal identification strategy was right, you can still do things wrong during estimation. So estimation is important. It's just not the focus of my talk here. And so um, I believe that this thing, like the backdoor criterion, is very much the, the canonical thing that people think of when hearing the term causal inference. Um, but before I already promised that I just don't, I don't just want to show you something else to add to your toolbox, but give you something that can be applied in many contexts. So um, I want to talk to you about missing data. And I have to say, up until recently, I found missing data exceedingly confusing, and in particular, the literature on it. And I just couldn't grasp the standard terminology. It's like also confusing, like, why is this missing at random, and this is not random, and so on. Um, but there's actually the possibility to approach the issue um, from a causal inference perspective um, that I want to um, explain to you right now. It has been um, spelled out in a paper by um, Felix Temmes and Katika Mohan. So let's say you were interested um, in the effect of, for example, a certain therapy on depressiveness. Why? And, and what we have here is a situation in which um, depressiveness after the therapy is partially unobserved because some people, for example, didn't show up. And so um, how can we use DAX for this? Well, we expand DAX in a, in a particular manner. And it is, um, first of all, we add our actually observed variable into um, the DAG. So this is the depressiveness that we actually measure. And this will be either observed, then it's the actual value, the Y, or it's unobserved, then it's, for example, if you're using R, it's NA, not available. And then there is um, actually another variable that affects this observed variable, and that is the so-called missingness indicator. So this is just a variable that tells you whether um, Y has been observed or not. And so this sounds exceedingly convoluted, but it's actually quite simple if you think about it as a data matrix. So um, what you do have here is, um, you have your Y. So these are the true depressiveness values that you might not always observe. Then you have your actual data that has some missing values. And then just a binary missingness indicator is this variable observed or missing. So, and how does this um, help us for, for um, finding out what to do in this situation? So we can um, boil down the missingness situation to one crucial question. And that is, can we separate Y, so true depressiveness, from the missingness indicator, R, Y. 
And um, for example, the scenario I drew here, you can see that there's no variable pointing into the missingness indicator, just like a random residual. And it might, for example, be a situation in which there was just like a power outage that prevented people from um, filling out the questionnaire, which was totally random. And so um, now we need to figure out whether we can trace a path from Y to RY. There is actually one, it goes via our observed variable, but it's actually blocked because of the collider in the middle. So we don't need to worry about anything. And in principle, it means nothing needs to be done. And of course, um, this is a situation we know that missing completely at random. So there's nothing pointing into the missingness um, indicator. And of course, that's like the simplest possible, possible scenario. So let's make it a bit more complex than it pays that we talked about cause and inference. So let's assume, for example, whether or not people received therapy affects whether they follow up, which seems quite plausible. So if you feel like indebted to the people who did the study, you will show up. If you were in the control group, you might be kind of pissed and just not show up. And of course, there might be um, additional vari variables. Um, given that I got like a sick toddler at home, let's say this is childcare availability, which affects my depressiveness, but also affects whether or not I will have the time to fill out um, this follow-up survey. So if we add these additional um, arrows, then we suddenly get two open paths to travel from Y to RY. And the one is via X and the other is via A. And both transmit associations because we no longer got a collider, but we got like a confounding variable. And just like um, in normal decks, here we can um, try to block these. And so this is again the estimation part. So for example, you could do multiple imputation using both, both um, X and A as variables, or we could um, use full information maximum likelihood estimation, including these variables. We could do inverse probability weighting and so on. And the important thing for identification is that we include both X and A. So, and of course, this is a situation that is called missing at random because it's random conditional on the variables we got in the data we observe that we can use. And I think so far this won't have been like different from the standard um, missingness um, literature, just reframed in a bit of a different way. But so here's where I would um, put in the, the causal angle because you could also um, mix the situation up a bit. So let's assume there is like a later follow-up um, after the central follow-up and you assess some other variable that might be affected by Y. For example, this could be something like, you just ask people for subjective time pressure, and this may be affected by their previous um, depressiveness at the follow-up, so some people were just overwhelmed. And it will also be affected by the spare time that people have available in their lives in general, which also affects whether or not they showed up previously. So you got this like um, more complex structure, but what is actually happening here is, um, so from a causal inference perspective, it's now a completely different situation because Y affects A, which is affected by B, which is affected by RY. And you can already see, oh, there's a collider here, A. So actually this path is blocked, it's not problematic. But if you just use um, like just the correlational structure, you will have a variable that correlates both with the outcome and with missingness. And so if you just have like that correlational approach, oh, this looks the same like the previous situation. Well, let's take in um, A and use it during um, imputation or whatever. But if you actually did that here, you would open that path. And so you would actually introduce bias. So um, the right cause of action with mis missing data then depends on assumption about the underlying causal web. It's not just about the covariance structure. And that's the angle from which um, missingness is a causal inference problem. And this is, I think, where it deviates from the standard missing data um, management. So now we had um, two scenarios. Um, let's uh, move on to the third one. And that is, for example, a situation in which you got this A, but it's unobserved. And so again, you've got like a path there and it just can't be blocked. And there is, um, I guess, the worst situation if your outcome directly affects missingness. And for example, um, if Y is depressiveness, this is of course highly plausible that um, people who are super depressed are just more likely to be missing in your data because they can't make it. And that is, um, of course, kind of like the worst situation because RY couldn't be possibly blocked. It's not just because of an unobserved variable, it's because of the structure of the data. And um, I think these scenarios are normally summarized as not missing at random because you can't make the missing ran the missing as random given your data. And actually in these scenarios, it's not like you're not all doomed. So you can tighten assumptions and make additional assumptions and uh, um, arrive at something like partial identification or get like boundaries for the effects. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about that, you should check out the work by Katika Mohan.
So um, if you want to learn more about this approach, it was just like a teaser. Um, you should really read the, the paper by Thomas and Mohan. And um, Katika Mohan is doing like the cutting edge work on this topic. So she's a student of Judea Pearl who um, invented this whole DAC approach for causal inference. So I promised you to talk about missing data, but let's move on to something um, completely different. Maybe if you're not that interested in missing data, and that is generalizability and transportability. And I also believe that this is at the very cutting edge of causal inference um, right now. So um, the standard question here is, can we generalize findings from one population to another one? So if you run a study in one place, does it tell you something about how the study would turn out in another place? And, and there's obviously like a continuum of attitudes you could have um, towards that. The, the one approach is to kind of just implicitly generalize everything. And I think that often happens in psychology. So you do a study on a sample of students, and then you say, oh, we found a basic mechanism. And that means we learned something about how to treat veterans with PTSD. And that is obviously quite the leap, but there are like also more subtle variations of that, um, of that leap where people just assume that there's like a general human nature. And then there's also the other extreme that is like nothing ever generalizes. Every population at each point in time needs to be investigated separately because there's so many like hidden influences and moderators and so on. And um, of course, if you are, for example, doing cross-cultural research, you're probably more inclined to endorse this one because it justifies why you need to collect data everywhere um, to find out what's going on. And um, of course, these are like caricatures and there is probably um, a more, more productive stance that you could take in the middle that is like, Maybe sometimes you can generalize, it depends. But the question is, on what does it depend? And so the um, framework of transportability tries to formalize this. Let's start with a um, very simple example. Let's say you're interested in the effect of a particular um, vaccination, maybe for like a pandemic, and um, how it affects mortality. And let's say you do run a randomized control try in country A and estimate the average effect. So um, there might be side effects, but there's also protective effect. And then you arrive at an estimate um, of how the vaccination protects people or how it affects mortality. So from this trial, can we make any statements about the to be expected average effect in country B? And I think given that it's now like a pandemic setting, we are all primed to say, yes, of course. I mean, we did look at trials that happened in other countries to try to um, find out what was going on, but we also saw that there might be differences. And so um, if we want to tackle transportability with DAX, we add selection variables. And those represent mechanisms by which the populations differ. And this is a bit of a weird thing in, in DAG terminology, but you can just imagine it like this. For example, um, we know that age affects mortality and age might also interact with vaccination in its effect on mortality. In a DAG, you don't need to represent that because everything is non-parametric. So anything can interact by default. And we add the selection node to indicate that the two populations might differ in the age structure. For example, um, Japan has a very different age structure from the US. And now, once again, um, we, we spelled out our assumptions. And now the crucial questions to generalize cause and effects is, can we separate the outcome of interest, so mortality, from the selection node S? And if we can do that, we are actually in a good situation because then there are um, fixed rules for how to estimate the causal effect in the target population. And um, in this particular example, it's something that I think a lot of people did intuitively um, because in this particular scenario, you would need to think, okay, so age um, affects how the vaccine works. So you will try to get at something like you, you stratify your sample by age and then estimate how the vaccination protects people. And then we see like small differences, for example, for younger people, it might not have such a large protective effect because the um, disease is not as bad for them and so on. And then if you want to transport it to a new population, you just reweigh them. So if you want to apply this to a much older population, you put higher weight on the older um, participants. But if you want to reweight it for a younger population, of course, the younger ones get more important, uh, more important. And so you end up with slightly different average marginal effects. So um, if we, for example, try to apply that to a psychology, of course, a canonical example would be, can studies conducted in undergrad samples inform us about effects in the general population? And so we can say, yes, it depends. And it depends on where the selection nodes are pointing in. And so for example, if it's something about fundamental cognitive mechanisms, we actually um, would kind of assume that there isn't that many um, differences at early points in the causal chain. So maybe transportability is more plausible, but if it was about something um, like highly social where we assume all oh, the people are very different in these behaviors and so on, then it would get harder. And of course you can actually take it to the next level and say, can animal studies inform us about psychological processes and humans? 
And there it very much depends on the particularities of the causal web. And I think that's already um, like encoded information for many people working with animals that they know how the animals deviate. And that's all knowledge about the causal web, web in animals versus humans. And um, just a very recent example is can lab studies on decision maker bias inform us about the effects of decision maker bias in the real world. And um, I want to bring that up because it recently caused a bit of a stir. So um, Joe Cesario does studies on police shootings and whether they are racially biased. And so he wrote this article, um, it's a target article in behavioral and brain sciences, so it's quite visible. And he first explains why the experimental studies do not necessarily apply to everyday life. And these are all um, good points he's actually making there. So um, if you have like undergraduates and they push a button whether they would shoot or not, that is probably not very close to the actual behavior you're interested in. And so he lists like three flaws and they are just really variations of threats to validity. And that's all fine at work, but then it suddenly kind of flips. So it suddenly starts invoking like crime statistics and correlational evidence to essentially say, it really boils down to black people are shot more frequently because they are more criminal. And of course it caused like a huge outrage um, and it's a PBS target article. So there was a call for commentaries and, and um, we kind of had to write a commentary on that. Um, because I felt like the other commentaries might be kind of like missing the point because people are so upset. And I'm very proud of the title, which is why I'm showing it to you. And so our, the point we made was like psychologists like the training and vocabulary to talk about cause and inference consistently. So we really like these threads of validities, but if that is your tool for causal inference, you can just like pull out a thread whenever you don't like the finding and say, oh, no, no, this is wrong because, and then this is the threat to validity that applies here. But this approach doesn't really motivate you to find out what's happening in your own research. Like if you try to make claims because you're just like always looking for threats in other people's claims, not in your own claims. And so we suggest that instead, instead people should have like a consistent cause and inference framework where you need to explicitly spell out your assumptions. For example, you need to draw the deck and be willing to defend it to arrive at your conclusions. And so actually after we wrote that commentary, so Joe Cesario actually reached out to me and asked whether I wanted to collaborate um, with him and help him analyze observational data, and which in my eyes um, really shows that, um, so he does not want to push an agenda about police shootings, he really wants to figure out what is going on, but his training does not provide him the right tools to tackle this, so he needs help from somebody who has actually received that um, training. So this was a bit of a digression just because there's recent issues. So back to the issue of generalizability. Um, there are a few papers and introductions to that. I find most of them not very accessible, but luckily <laughs> we just dropped a preprint on that. So if you want to check that out, um, so we apply to cross-cultural generalizability, but as far as I can tell, it's the most accessible introduction to transportability um, so far. Sorry. And um, it's maybe interesting to think about the cross-cultural case because they're even very simple things. So just comparing two traits in two populations already entails a lot of causal assumptions. So I think it's an interesting case to think about. So that was a lot. <laughs> and um, I don't want you to, to keep all the details in your head, but more like the general approach. So um, the causal inference framework kind of always starts with a query that is a cause effect in the target population. And then you draw a model. These are essentially your assumptions. And then you have all sorts of um, data available and all of them are admissible in principle. And um, if you put these three together, then it actually gets quite algorithmic because there are clear inference rules. So it's like so-called dual cultures. And that will first of all tell you whether a solution exists or not. Sometimes there is no solution. Um, you just don't have the right assumptions or the right data you would need. And, but if a solution exists, you do get an estimable expression of the right answer to your question. And if no solution exists, the framework might inform you how you can tighten assumptions if you really do need an answer. So now, of course, the one crucial point that I skipped earlier is are our assumptions horribly unrealistic? That is what I get from um, psychologists. And my answer would be yes, they probably are. And so I think the central point I want to make here is that um, there is no inference without assumptions. And so I think, at least in psychology, I don't know about other fields, people really like to think that their inferences don't rest on strong assumptions. And I think that normally it just reflects that they really haven't thought about them as deeply as they ought to. And so the benefit of um, spelling out assumptions in the causal inference framework is that they are more transparent than in other contexts because you have to actively spell them out because they are part of the inference engine. 
And, and they are also formalized, which is kind of nice because it allows for certain quantitative sensitivity analyses. So there are actually approaches to say, okay, what if there was a confounder? Okay, how strong would that need to be to render the effect zero and so on? But there's another point where I think that we um, need to be serious about um, assumptions and that is pluralism and causal inference. And because in the end, causal inference, like any sort of inference is about learning from data. And we do have many different types of data and there might be many different set of assumptions. And in an ideal scenario, this diversity results in more robust inferences. So this is the idea of triangulation that you need to collect data and evidence from many different um, sources. But that really only works um, if the different methods make different assumptions. Otherwise, anything just suffers from the same bias and you might arrive at that wrong impression. Oh, like 20 studies showed this, this must be really robust, but all of the studies make the same assumptions. So actually your evidence is super, um, like super um, sensitive to any change in this particular assumption. So um, I believe that spelling out assumption that this point could really um, increase transparency, move our field forward. And last but not least, um, I think the thing I most frequently get from people I really value and who are working with complex language and data is, I, I don't even want to do anything causal inference related. And so um, my, my question for these people, is, are you entirely sure that you're not trying to do something causal inference related? And um, we got a paper in which we argue that there's a certain structure, um, at least happening in psychology, where people will be like, oh, X predicts Y, and here's my study, and it's all about prediction. Um, but what you really want people to take away is X as a cause and effect on Y. Everything in your introduction, everything in your conclusion, everything in your discussion points towards the cause and effect of X and Y. And um, this sets up something that um, you can call a Morton Bailey um, argument, and this is like, um, named after this uh, CASA structure. So um, you got this very easily defensible claim, X predicts Y, because that's just like a statistical regularity. Uh, but you also got that much more comfortable thing that you actually people want to take away, X has a cause and effect on Y. And now once, um, once you get a tag, once somebody's like, oh, but you forgot this confounder, you're like, no, 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 no. You didn't read our paper properly. We said X predicts Y. Of course, it's not a causal claim, right? And of course, it's like an attempt to have your cake and eat it too. And I really find it intellectually unsatisfying because you can't even like disagree productively because it's not even sure what the study is trying to do. And since I've been bashing psychology um, so much, um, I want to point out that this is um, probably the same in health research. So we got a recent preprint and what we did is we reviewed the language used in observational health studies. And, and what, we, what you can see here is like a list of linking words that people used to describe the essential association they were investigating. And as you can see, oh, all the people are doing a good job. They are just talking about association. And that is because in health, health, science, in health studies, there is like a very strong, um, like really highly sanctioned, like you only use causal language if you have an RCT. And some people even don't use causal language when they did an RCT. But then we also had people rage, well, let's look at the sentence that is like linking the exposure and the outcome. How strongly does that imply causality? And actually many cases, even though they never say cause, and look, nobody ever did that, I think, in, that, in those 1,000 papers, a lot of them will actually kind of strongly or at least moderately imply causality. And then if you actually look at the methods of the papers, a lot of them talk about confounders or include control variables and so on. And a lot of these things only make sense if you believe that they try to do causal inference, but they are still using that non-causal language to kind of get through the peer review process. And um, I, once again, I believe this is like a situation that is like intellectually unsatisfying and it doesn't really lead to anything. So um, this is my take on people who are saying they are just interested in prediction. But of course, it is perfectly um, possible that you are indeed not interested in causal um, effect. Or maybe what's more realistic, I think, is that you're not entirely sure what you are even interested in. And that's at least what I see in my own work, but also when reviewing papers. And um, there's a wonderful article by a group of sociologists. And the first author was just a graduate stu student when writing this. So I really love this article. And I will just read it to you because I think it's the perfect, it's making the perfect point there. We make only one point in this article. Every quantitative study must be able to answer the question, what is your estimate? The estimate is the target quantity, the purpose of the statistical analysis. Much attention is already placed on how to do estimation. A similar degree of care should be given to defining the things we are estimating. We advocate that authors state the central quantity of each analysis, the theoretical estimate, in precise terms that exist outside of any statistical model. 
And so if I could force the audience members to just read one thing, I would really recommend this article because it's an excellent vision of how to really improve um, social science, but also science um, in general. Um, because if we zoom out a bit, I think there's a common phenomenon that we um, tend to put the statistical card before the substantive force. And um, we let the statistical models dictate the question which, are, which we ask and we are like, oh, this is only correlational. And maybe this reminds you of the first keynote um, where he said that in some fields, there's just like default models. So some fields just use latent growth curve models for everything. And that really restricts the question they can ask because the model is fit to a purpose and it might not fit the purpose of the researchers. And so my biggest hope actually um, for, for psychology, but also for other sciences is that we can flip this around and that we all get much more clearer and transparent about what we are trying to achieve in the first place. And then spell out the assumptions under which the um, right answer can be retrieved from the data at hand. And uh, so this might involve causal influence. Maybe it actually doesn't. Um, but I think in any case, we need that conceptual clarity to make productive progress. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, just, just imagine the clapping uh, by people. <laughs> and I'm sure there are questions. I've already seen one raised hand on the chat earlier. That was by Breda. Now you're gone again. Breda, if you would like to ask a question, then please re-raise your hand again. Uh, if that was an accident, no worries otherwise let me start with christian um yeah thank you julia for this excellent talk i wish i could give such a talk to my um, students to introduce this topic this was just great and um thanks glad you liked it uh, i have a question um, you said that um, uh, scientists should be um, very explicit about the target quantity yes. that they would like to estimate and then on the other hand, um, a current practice in the traditional structural equation modeling is to try to identify an entire model, a whole model. And um, I, I would like to hear your, your opinion about this. Um, uh, and is this, um, uh, will this practice change or what do you think about um, this situation? Excellent, and it's a crucial point. So, and it is also so, um, I'm currently working on a paper on causal inference and longitudinal data with Kumo Rayama, and we actually tried to tackle that one, but it's a really tough one. And so, yeah, there's that tradition where you're like trying to recover the true model and include all the paths and try to estimate them simultaneously. And so first of all, if you actually want to give a causal interpretation to all of the errors, like they are meant to be, I think in psychology, this might be doomed. Um, <laughs> because I, I do not believe that we can, assuming it's really complex systems, we're not going to get at all of the errors, right? Um, so, and there's actually an article by the epidemiologist uh, Van der Wehle, who actually argues, oh, are structural equation models any use for epidemiology? No, because we actually want to identify like one effect, but properly. And so the SEM thing is like, you try to estimate everything at once. And so that is like the one take where it's like, no, we don't need all of that. And so that's actually not my take on it. Um, because I believe you can use these models, um, but still focus on a central um, target quantity of interest, right? And that actually makes life easier because then if the other arrows, um, they might not really reflect the true causal effects. Um, but sometimes it might not even matter because you don't want to give a substantive interpretation to them. They're just capturing something else up there and you'll just have the focal effect you're interested in. So that is um, what I'm converting to, which would also be like a bit of a um, like pragmatic take, right? So you can use these models. Maybe don't give them a fully realistic interpretation, but SEM, for example, is great because it can incorporate measurement error, which actually matters for causal influence um, practices. You can't do that that easily in just a regular regression, which the epidemiologists seem to prefer. So that's my take here. And I also have to say, like, I'm now like interviewing mathematicians, and statisticians for like a causal influence course. And actually some of them are using um, structural equation modeling and they are like kind of very aware. It's like a great tool to take care of the measurement error, also to include many things at once, but they are still like interested in identifying one focal effect and the SEM is just a tool and it won't give you the full causal web. And that's my current take, but I might be wrong here. Yeah, no, thank you um, uh, for, for this detailed answer. And um, this also reminds me a bit about a uh, um, uh, recent suggestion by Ken Bolin, who gave a keynote presentation yesterday, but he is um, not here today due to the time shift. And um, he proposed the methods called um, uh, 
model implied instrumental variables. So a whole graph is drawn, a whole path diagram is drawn, but only um, certain edges are identified. But you need the entire graph, the entire path diagram, to see which variables are instruments and which parts of the graph are identified and which are not. So I think that's a really, really nice way to go. Yes, yeah, and I think there's like a convergency happening between the structural equation modeling people and the DAG people because they're like, oh, if you draw the full DAG, you will find an instrument that can give you plausible identification. And he's like arriving at the same point. I mean, he, I think he has written something with Perl, right? So that like yeah. inherent co um, convergence, which is nice to see. All right, thank you. Any other questions? So I hope um, my, my slides got through in the chat. There's also like a link to a reading list and it's not entirely up to date because I updated the talk um, yesterday, but maybe it's helpful. I also try to rank the things because I'm not very good at reading methods papers and I rank them according like to their levels so how technical they get. I'm sure that's super useful. Uh, Dakota. Hi, uh, Julia, thanks for the um, talk. It was really, really great. I, I love that perspective. and. I thought Christian's question was really great there too, um, to contrast the modeling versus uh, focusing on a specific effect. I was curious, I was just wondering if you've been thinking at all about the front door criterion and maybe if you could share any thoughts that you have about that. <laughs> Okay, so um, for those of you who are not aware with the um, DAG stuff, so um, there's this backdoor criterion that is like to close anything that might confound the association, but there's actually also a front door criterion. And that is essentially, um, you can have a scenario in which there's like all sorts of backdoor confounding, but you still know all the mechanisms through which X affects Y, and it still allows you to identify the cause effect. And it's actually fairly simple if you do it in loop calculus. So, um, and the, the canonical example, I think that Pearl uses for that is like smoking and lung cancer. And if you assume that the full mechanism is um, like a deposition of tar in the lungs, then you can actually identify the effect no matter which unobserved confounders there are between smoking and lung cancer. And I'm actually, so um, I'm a bit on, on the side of George uh, uh, Davy Smith with that one where it's like, so it, it's mathematically, it's nice and elegant. I can't think of, any plausible um, application within my own field, psychology. So any scenario where I know all mechanisms and can measure them, right? Because that is the um, assumption here. So I, I would really like to have, because I sometimes get asked about that as well, I would like to have a convincing application for my own field that I could point to. Um, but right now I don't, I don't see it happening and I see like more, more, sorry, more plausible like cases of instrumental variables and so on, which are also novel to psychologists at least. Um, so I think that might be more productive, but I would love to see somebody do a front door identification. I've just never seen it. Yeah, that's the impression that I have as well. I mean, what I've heard a little bit too, but it's great to hear that you're having similar, um, hearing similar things. And I think there's a question from Ellen. Um, yes, hi. Um, oh, let's see if I can, uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know how to turn on my camera, so I'm sorry, <laughs> not very, very used to zoom yet. Uh, um, so I have one, well, I actually have two questions. So I, well, first of all, I really loved your talk and I'm very glad that you are, um, also indicating that there might still be some room for structural equation modeling, because I'm sometimes worried about this. Um, but um, the thing I was really curious about is um, you have the example with uh, childhood uh, intelligence and then adult intelligence, but somewhere in between there could also be like the teenage uh, uh, intelligence and so on. So I'm wondering like, how do you decide uh, when you think of uh, variables that you could measure repeatedly, how do you decide how often you would have to measure them repeatedly or even just represent them repeatedly in your DAG to see whether or not you have to control for them. And the other question I have is, uh, I think a completely different question. Um, so this is about the, the selection bias that you showed with uh, the college students. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about this a lot when, when we do a lot of research into particular clinical groups um, and depressed people or um, 
uh, people with uh, certain um, psychiatric uh, disorders. And how does this play out there? Because yeah, is that also dependent on whether you say this is a different population versus the, the healthy population, or if you think about it more as a continuum and, and how does that then uh, affect whether or not there is an, an issue with selection there? And there are two excellent questions. I'm going to start with the second one because it's easier. Um, so yeah, if you do the thing where you write like select clinical groups, like depressed individuals, and then for example, I know what people like to do is those network symptoms, right? That looks at the intercorrelation of the symptoms and so on and tries to figure out um, how, how um, psychological disorders are maintained and is very much kind of giving a cause interpretation to the errors there. And I actually do believe that because the symptoms determine whether you get the diagnosis, and that gets you selected into the sample. I do believe that the, these analyses have a huge um, issue with endogenous selection bias, so like that collider bias. And so I'm very like, if you look at associations between symptoms within um, groups that have a clinical diagnosis, you are probably going to underestimate a lot of things that are much higher correlated in the actual population, which is relevant for if you assume that there are some causal net. And now, if you assume that these were actually different populations of people, right, and I think that's what people are kind of hoping, um, then this might be um, kind of okay and no issue because you're looking at different causal dynamics in different groups. I don't think this holds true for most um, diagnostic groups that we have, that these are like natural kinds that are different groups of people out there. It may be true, for example, if you have like a rare genetic disorder and then you want to see how symptoms correlate among these people, but then you have to have the a priori knowledge that these are indeed groups that are distinct on this one criterion and that justifies just looking at the one group. Um, but yeah, I think it's a tough issue. And I, I think some people in the network literature are discussing it, but uh, it's a very good point. And for example, if you then have a network in non-depressed people and we have replicated, uh, no, you have it in depressed people, and then you replicate it in like a student sample that is completely non-depressed, um, you will find the same pattern because the collider bias is in both groups. So um, that's a potential issue there. And the other thing was like the dimension of time. So for example, how do you determine how often to measure things? Um, and um, I think that's a tough one. And I do think, so there's like a part where the causal inference literature is not as strong um, invested in time as the longitudinal modeling uh, tradition in psychology. Um, because I think normal people are just like, this is my focal effect, so I need to um, measure everything at this point in time. But if I got previous time points, that is kind of nice, it helps me to control for things. Um, but it's not like being prescriptive about how often you have to measure and to find the right solution. And um, for example, with your example, um, with like childhood intelligence and then adult intelligence and so on, um, I guess from a causal inference perspective, you would just say like any, um, any measure of intelligence that you have prior to um, the treatment, which is like your college degree, that would be helpful and ought to be controlled for. And then any intelligence that happens afterwards actually doesn't even need to be measured um, because it's probably not going to be helpful because it's like already affected by the outcome. Um, but I don't think this is well integrated. So I, I, I don't have a proper answer, I'm sorry for that. Um, it's just like a very good um, issue that I don't think has been discussed um, in quite that much detail yet. Right. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. Uh, yeah, to just think along. And um, yeah, I'm very curious to see what will happen in this area. Thank you. Thank you. So there is something in the chat. We wrote a paper of this where we listed five different estimates people might be interested in when they condition on something like depressed state before estimating the model. Oh, that is awesome. I don't think I've seen that one yet. Or have I? No. Awesome. So um, thanks, uh, uh, Oisin, for this uh, shout out. I haven't seen that one, but it seems very relevant to me because I keep wondering a lot about network models. It's not my um, speciality, but I do keep wondering about it because it seems so confusing. So thanks. I'm going to look into that. Cool. So I'm glad the workshop was helpful in this regard to bring people together and uh, to share work and ideas. And Julia, I think you've done a wonderful job in, again, in communicating things and in giving us this review and your thoughts and perspectives on things. So that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And Thank thanks you. for the great questions. It was really fun.